Good morning. How are you? Who has good worship this morning? Y'all was singing. I heard you. Every one of you. Some of you too loud, but you sang. That's good. Yeah, glad you're here this morning, ready to jump into uh, the next week of our series. But before I do, um, I want to share something with you. I'll put that up on the screen for me, if you will. Um, see this up here on the screen? It says, Summer Fling. Don't, don't switch the F with an S, all right? Don't do that. Summer Fling is what we're looking for. Let me tell you a little bit about this. Um, in a church our size, I often hear people say, Man, I just don't know everybody. I wish I knew somebody else. Now, the introverts that are in here this morning, y'all just shrank about three more inches, all right? But if you want to get to know people, we're going to provide an opportunity for you to get to know people. If you grab your, uh, grab your smartphone, um, if you go to our website, mylivingwater.cc, First, if you go get that now, you'll be ready for the sermon notes here in a minute. But right at the top of the page is a way that you can sign up for this. And also, there's some uh, cards that I'm holding. There's some clipboards right down here and a basket that I already see some things in, which is cool. You can fill it out. Let me tell you what Summer Fling is. This is what you're going to do. You're going to sign up. You're going to say um, if you're married or single. By the way, it's okay to be single. Single doesn't mean you're missing something. It means you're completely complete in God, okay? Um, whether you're married or single, your age. Be honest. Um, Do you have kids, the ages of your kids, and your phone number, address? Um, Excuse me. (coughs) I'm going to do that a lot this morning, so I go ahead and apologize, all right? Um, Let me tell you what we're going to do. Over the summer, um, we're going to take and we're going to pull names out of a hat and we're going to put you together with three other couples or with uh, other singles or other, this is not a hookup, all right? Um, With other couples, singles, whatever it may be. And over the summer, you're going to get to know these people. One month, you're going to call and go, hey, you want to come to my house for a barbecue or we're going to go out to eat? You're going to choose the place. The next month, another person on the list is going to choose the place. The next month, another person is. So during the summer, you're going to get a chance to meet two other couples, hang out with them, find out that their kids are just as screwed up as yours are. You're going to find out all the info. It's going to be cool. You're going to get to know other people. All right, introverts, welcome back to church. We won't talk about this anymore, all right? I'd love for you to sign up for this. Missy and I have already signed up. If my name happens to get pulled out of the hat along with yours, we're just going to call it Party with the Pastor. And we're going to have a good time over the summer, all right? It's going to be really cool. Please sign up for this. It's going to be a lot of fun. And by the way, it's on you. If you say, I don't know enough people in the church, and you don't sign up for this, then it's on you, okay? Because here's an opportunity. I'm going to put a cough drop in so that I don't cough in this microphone the entire time. Anybody else struggling with allergies this summer or fall or whatever time of the year it is? Since you woke up back at Christmas time, you feel that way? Um, that's where I've been for the last three weeks. But uh, go ahead and switch over to our, our title. And um, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do this morning. We're in week number two of our series entitled Sent. If you're new to our church, we always do series. We think in series because we want you to stay in something and learn more and more about it as we go through it. Last week, I introduced this series with an understanding that if, uh, if you are a Christian, Um, Now, I I recognize there may be people here that aren't Christians, aren't sure about Jesus, and we want you to know we created this environment for you. We want you to feel welcome. We want to see what your next step is and want you to take it. But if you are a Christian, and the majority of people that are here this morning are Christians, God left you here to live a life that was sent for him. It's not just about you. It's about reaching others, and it's how we can be a blessing to other people. When we use the word bless, we were going to talk about this today and in the weeks to come. This idea of blessing is not the southern bless your heart because you're an idiot. That's not what it means. We're going to talk because that's what you do when the people drive bad or cut in front of you in line or, you know, bless their heart. I just, you know, in southern term, that means you're stupid, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about blessing other people, and and I'll share with you uh, more about it, but this morning, we're going to start this idea of living a life that is sent. It starts, it begins with prayer. So let me pray. God, I love you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for the chance to be able to uh, just share what you put on my heart to use this to uh, bring people to you. God, I'm looking forward to what you're going to do this morning, what you already did in first service and what you're going to do now. Uh, We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's jump in. Um, 
How many of you like to be chosen? Now the introverts went again went, no, all right. But you like to be, listen, it takes me back to uh, kickball on the playground. It's always good to be chosen. Y'all remember play, kickball on the playground? Y'all remember that? It's always good to be chosen. Listen, if you're the kid that didn't get chosen and that's still bothering you, you need to see a counselor and get over it, all right? But anyway, um, that's terrible. Um, but, but to be chosen, like I rem- I'm going to date myself here, okay? I remember going to the skating rink and whenever there was a couple skate and it was girl's choice on who she wanted to skate with and that girl would choose me to skate, it was like, <laughs> all right, I was chosen. This is great. It, it always feels great to be chosen. Over the years, I've developed a, uh, uh, something that with Missy and I, Missy's my wife, by the way, um, with Missy and I, every once in a while, I'll just, I don't know, turn and look at her and catch a glimpse of her in a certain light or something. Don't get weird. And, uh, and, and when I look at her, I'll go, hey, Thanks for marrying me. And I love her response. Her response is always this. Always, she says this. Thanks for asking. I love that. It reminds me that I chose her and she chose me. And we got to choose. It always feels good to be chosen. Well, if you're a Christian this morning, that means God has chosen you for something. He has handpicked and selected you. And he selected you to do something for him. And that is to live a life that is Sent. Matter of fact, I'm going to get you to repeat something with me this morning. They'll put it up on the screen. I've got it written right here in mine. Um, and I want to read this with you. You guys throw that up on the screen for me. This is the statement I want you to catch, all right? God wants to use me to reach someone who doesn't know him. Will y'all say this with me? I want you to say it with me, all right? Say it like you mean it. Are you ready? We're going to do this together. Ready? Here we go. God wants to use me to reach someone who doesn't know him. Him. That is living a life that is sent. Let me add a little bit to this. We're going to say another statement, all right? Put the other one up there for me. God has sent me to bless others. Say it with me. You ready? Here we go. God has sent me to bless others. If you don't believe that about yourself, you might be missing what God has done in your life. God has sent you for these purposes. Your life is not just yours, just to, just to go back and forth and go, hey, I'm going to live and just enjoy the time that I've... No, God has sent you for a purpose. He wants you to reach people. He wants you to bless others. Now, last week, when I started this message, I gave you an acrostic for the word bless. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the first one on the acrostic today, but I want to catch you up with them. They're going to throw them up on the screen for me. And remember, all the sermon notes are on, online if you want to go to our website, mylivingwater.cc, and catch that, and you'll get them. But let me give you this acrostic, all right? It's the word bless, and here it is. Begin with prayer. Everybody say begin with prayer. Cool, you're with me. Listen with care. Engage with intention. Now, if you were here last week, I wrote the word eat, and I thought it was kind of weird to put eat with intention, because we all eat with intention, all right? So engage with intention. All right, let's do the next one. Serve with, serve with love and share my story. So let's begin with prayer, all right? This is where we're going to start this morning. If we do not begin with prayer, you may be somebody who says, I, I know I'm supposed to share Jesus, I know I'm supposed to tell people, but if you don't begin with prayer, you'll be very ineffective, you, you, it, it just doesn't work just to walk out and go, well, I'm a Christian. No, start with prayer. You'll be very ineffective living a life that is sent if you don't begin with prayer. Um, if we think back over the last few weeks and we remember that it was just a few weeks ago that we celebrated Easter, the resurrection of Jesus. Well, in, in history, in that place and time, after the resurrection of Jesus, the disciples, you know, at, at different points, they had all kind of abandoned Jesus and deserted him other than John. They'd kind of deserted and abandoned, but Jesus appeared to them. Matter of fact, it says in scripture that over the next 40 days, he appeared to over 500 people um, and to the disciples. So they had been there. Um, so the resurrection, is t- the resurrection changed everything. Jesus really did do what he said he was going to do. So everything has changed. The disciples, they've gathered multiple times with Jesus. He's shown up and, and been in their appearance, eating some fish with them, and, and just had good times with them and talked to them. Well, this, this, this time comes. 
Jesus is going to ascend back to his Father in heaven. So in the book of Acts in chapter 1, maybe you're familiar with the story, Jesus is gathered on the Mount of Olives, a place where they had gathered many, many times over the years. And Jesus is gathered there and, and Jesus ascends into heaven. He tells the disciples, he commissions them to go into all the world, to, to go in Judea and Samaria and tell people they're living sent. Well, after Jesus ascends, the disciples have watched him go up and, and then these angels appear. And the angels are like, hey, dudes. Well, I mean, if they were skater angels, they would have said that. But they said, hey, hey guys, why are you standing here? Why are you hanging out? This same Jesus who went up into heaven, he's going to come back one day. Go do what he told you to do. So look what the disciples did. This, this is kind of cool. If you've got a Bible and you want to turn there or you just want to follow along, that's good too. In Acts chapter 1, verse 12, look what the disciples thought to do right off the bat. Look at this in verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem. From the hill, they called the Mount of Olives. It was about a, a Sabbath day's walk from the city, and, and that means it was a short walk. We won't get into a lot of detail there. Uh, verse 13, when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they had been staying. Those present, and, and this is kind of cool, it gives us the ones who were there. Those present were Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon, the zealot. And Judas, the son of James, not Judas Iscariot, because he had lived in regret and killed himself, but Judas, the son of James. Look at verse 14. They all joined together constantly in prayer. And along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and also Jesus' brothers. And I always find it interesting that Jesus' brothers decided to become Christians after their brother raised from the dead. Which again, if you had a sibling who said he was the son of God, would you believe him? Not until he raised from the dead. And then I would believe one of my brothers was actually God. I mean, they might think they are, but they're not, all right? Um, here's the thing. The disciples knew that if they did not start with prayer, nothing could ever change. See, it's not necessarily that we can change the world. It's not necessarily that just our prayers can change the world. Let me give you this statement. Uh, God uses prayer to change us. And then God uses us to change our world, the people around us. If, if, I took, um, if I took 10 seconds right now and I just went completely quiet and I said, I want you to think of five people that you come in contact with every day that God can lay on your heart, that you need to tell them about Jesus or share your story or engage with them or just begin to pray for them. If you could name five, matter of fact, let's just do it, all right? If you're watching online, there's not gonna be a glitch. We're just gonna go quiet for a minute. Um, if, if you're sitting in here this morning, let's do it. I, if, I'm, I'm gonna be quiet for 10 seconds. I'll look on my watch. For 10 seconds, I'm gonna be quiet. In that 10 seconds, I want you to think of five people that you can begin to pray for. Are you ready? Here we go. You ready? Go. How many of you thought of five people? Doesn't take long, does it? it? It doesn't take long. See, God has you in this moment. And if you will begin with prayer, God can begin to change you. And then God can begin to change the world around you. And it all begins with prayer. A couple of things that I can see in these verses is, is this. The first thing is that prayer changes us first. You don't think the disciples were changed by prayer? They had lived the last three and a half years or so watching Jesus pray, living in this, so much so that the first thing they knew to do was go pray. I was reading a book this week on prayer, and I came across this little sentence, a couple of sentences. I want to read it to you. Listen to this. It's not going to be on the screen. Um, the, the author says this. He said, prayer is like breathing. Breathing has a rhythm of inhaling and then exhaling. We breathe in the oxygen we need and then exhale carbon dioxide that the plants around us need. It's this rhythm of inhaling and exhaling that brings life both to us and to our planet. Without oxygen, we would die. Without carbon dioxide, our green world would shrivel up and also die. Prayer is the same. We breathe in to listen to God. We need his voice to sustain our spiritual life. We then breathe out a prayer for our neighbors, anticipating that it will bring spiritual life to them. Isn't that kind of cool? Prayer changes us 
first. So get that and then get this. Prayer is both how we discover the mission and how we pursue the mission. It's in prayer that God, just, just a few minutes ago, I said, take 10 seconds and think of five people. It's in that moment, in that very moment that God spoke to you and God said, these are the five people. Now, he's told you the five people. How are you going to pursue it? See, here's the thing about God. Whenever we pray about something, it's not like we're supposed to sit back and say, God, will you answer my prayer? Now I'm just going to sit here and wait. (laughs) Corey Ten Boom, who was a Holocaust survivor, she wrote in in a book one time, she wrote these words. Let me read them to you. She said this. She said, we never know how God will answer our prayers, but we can expect that he will get us involved in his plan for the answer. Do you know that oftentimes when we're praying to God for something, when we're saying, God, what you want us to do? God's answer will come in the form of, I need you to do something. I need you to be part of this. Listen, I can't tell you how many times over the years I have had husbands or wives call me and say, hey, I really need prayer in my marriage. And you may be sitting there going, God, I really want you to do something crazy in our marriage. And God is probably up in heaven going, uh, why don't you do something in your marriage? Won't you love that person I gave you? Don't wait till things get bad. Love them to start with. Parents praying to God going, God, I don't know what to do with my children. They're so rebellious and they don't listen when people talk to them. And God's going, "Uh uh-huh, that's why I gave them to you. (laughs) Number one, paying you back for you being a jerk. Number two, because who better to teach them how to obey than the person that had to learn to obey? I wonder if God wants us involved in every one of our prayers. We lay it before God and then God says, okay, come be a part of it. Come be a part. We always begin with prayer. And see, Jesus lived that kind of a life. Jesus modeled that for us. Jesus lived a life that was about divine appointments, finding people along the way every single day that Jesus lived. And listen, he lived a life a lot like what we live. Jesus, yes, he was 100% God, but he gave up that godness and, and, and he took on humanity. He took that on so he could experience what we could experience so that he could say, I was tempted in all points like you are, yet without sin. So he could understand the way that we have to live as human beings. I think sometimes we have this mental picture of Jesus, or not even mental, we get to see these pictures of Jesus where he's walking around and there's always this halo over top of him. That wasn't who Jesus was. Jesus had to go to the bathroom. Jesus had to eat in order to sustain. He had to drink water. Jesus had to to live just like we have to live. Jesus had to experience birth just like we do. And if you've ever experienced birth, it's not pretty, all right? Jesus had to experience that as a human. So we get to model this. Jesus modeled it for us. Matter of fact, the book of Luke, uh, Luke was a doctor who uh, took and and interviewed people. And we even know that he interviewed Jesus's mother, which is, she's kind of firsthand with the birth there. Um, And and, and he interviewed a lot of other people, disciples, other ones who had written books that were were included in the Bible. And Luke wrote a a letter and, and wrote this book to a friend and said, this is my account and this is where I've got it. And I love Luke when he talks about Jesus. Often he will talk about the fact that Jesus was just living kind of day to day. And he starts a lot of his stories this way. In Luke chapter 6, verse, uh, verse 12, excuse me. <coughs> One of these days that's going to clear up, all right? In Luke chapter 6, verse 12, listen to how Luke writes this. He says, one of those days, and again, I, just, I love that Luke goes, yeah, it's just another day. One of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray. That sounds like a pretty good thing to do. And, and, you know, I'm with you. I'm like, well, if Jesus is God and God is Jesus, why is Jesus praying to himself? Well, that seems kind of weird. We'll answer that in a second. Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Now, some of you are going, man, I hope he's not going to ask us to pray all night. I, I, I'm not. I will tell you this. If you have a habit of waking up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, especially if you're married, I promise you, your spouse does not want to talk to you. That's probably God. You should talk to him, get off TikTok and just pray, all right? And see what happens, all right? Verse 13, when morning came, I I love this. I've, I've read this verse so many times, but just connecting this together. Jesus needed an answer. Jesus was stepping into a new phase of ministry. There were, there were a lot of people that were following him. There were a lot of people that he called disciples, that were walking around with him. There were women that were, that were helping fund some of the things. There were other people that were following. There was a lot of people that were following Jesus. But when Jesus needed an answer, he always spent time with his father in prayer. When morning came, he called his disciples to him. 
And he chose 12 of them. We're going to give a little bit of a repeat of what we read earlier in Luke. He chose 12 of them who he also designated as apostles. Simon, who he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and also Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Um, But it was only through that night that Jesus got his answer from the Father about who to choose. Now, I I don't know if God spoke to him audibly. If God, speaking to his son, said, Jesus, these are the 12. If he dropped like a grocery list down from heaven and said, choose these. I I can tell you that being a pastor and and leading an organization, um, this wouldn't have been the top 12 candidates I would have chosen. It's a bunch of fishermen, a bunch of brawlers. I don't know if you know what Simon the Zealot, do you know what the Zealot means? That means that he started rebellions and he liked to fight people. Um, I don't know, that might be a good idea in a church. Anyway, all right. Um, but, but this wouldn't have been the people, but Jesus, this is the ones his father wanted him to choose and he began with prayer. He, he began by saying, God, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to do this with? And if Jesus himself began his mission to bless the world with prayer, What do you think he wants us to do? I I think he wants us to begin everything with prayer. Now, if I can kind of click back to these disciples, and I'm going to interject a little bit, and you may go, well, that's not in the Bible, and I'm going to tell you, well, you can't prove that it's not, and I can't prove that it is, so we're fine, all right? Um, I know it's not in the Bible, but the story might have happened this way. When those disciples gathered in the upper room, Jesus has ascended into heaven. I wonder what the thoughts were. You you ever put yourself in that place? What do you think they were thinking? He he said he was going to die. Check. Um, He said he was going to rise again. We saw him. Check. He told us to wait here and pray. Check. I wonder what kind of thoughts they were having. I wonder if somewhere along the way, when they began to pray, they began to go back to the days when Jesus walked among them and said, you remember all those times we asked Jesus how to pray and to teach us to pray? Let's do it that way. Again, I don't know that they did this specifically, but I would imagine somewhere along the way they probably did. I wonder if they recalled this moment. Luke actually records it for us. Another one of these one days. In Luke 11, one, one day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John, your cousin, John the Baptist, just as John taught his disciples to pray. Now, you might be familiar, as a matter of fact, the more, more popular version of what they call the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer is recorded for us in Matthew. It's a little bit longer and has a little bit more detail. And some people say that when Luke wrote these words, he was Maybe copying from Matthew a little bit. But other people say, I would imagine that Jesus with his disciples, they didn't just ask him one time. They asked multiple times, Jesus, help us to pray. So Jesus probably answered similar ways. Maybe this is the way Luke saw this. But in Luke, two, Luke 11, 2, um, it's recorded this way. It says, he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Now, I've often heard uh, people say that that our our prayers should be modeled after this, and if you want to include elements of your prayer uh, when you pray every day with honoring God and staying humble and seeking forgiveness and provision and asking Him for guidance, that's great. If you want to pray those words, that's great. Um, Listen, prayer needs to be about this relationship with God. And you begin with it. God, who can you put on my heart today? Who who can you cross my path with today? I love that when Jesus is telling this particular particular prayer to the disciples, he's also got kind of a bigger point in telling them. Listen, listen, you all know that Jesus tells a lot of stories. Did you all know that? In verse 5, the story kind of goes into where Jesus, and he's going to make an even bigger point. Look at this. In verse 5, Jesus said to them, then Jesus said to them, "Um," and I I imagine Jesus probably had fun when he told stories. So he said, suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight, and you say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. Now, all of you just got a mental image of three loaves of wonder bread walking to the door. That's, that's not what it was like. It was, it was a different world and a different time. Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a, came on a journey and has come to me. 
and I have no food to offer him. Now, understand that in this particular society, at this particular time, this story would have made a whole lot better sense to them because in their world, they typically had enough food for the day. Um, In the morning is when they would usually get up and they would knead out the bread and bake enough bread for the day. Well, this particular man had run out of bread and he was hoping that his neighbor who lived nearby had extra bread, kind of specific that Jesus tells in this story, I need three loaves of bread. Now, verse 7, I like this. And suppose the one inside, the neighbor whose door's being knocked on, the one inside says, don't bother me. Isn't that what y'all would say if somebody knocked on your door at midnight and said, give me three loaves of bread? Seems kind of real. So the one inside says, don't bother me. The door's already locked and my children and I, (laughs) I'm sorry, my children and I are already in bed. How many of y'all got kids who fight sleep every single night? Y'all got kids that fight sleep? Raise your hands really high. All right. What would you think if some dude came knocking on your door at midnight and you had just got your kids to bed? Yeah, I got some bread and a cold 45 and we're going to make this work. Not the alcoholic kind. I'm going to knock you off my porch. That's what it would have seen. But Jesus has given a real story. Suppose, suppose you had a neighbor that stopped by your house or a friend that stopped by your house at midnight. You go to your neighbor's house. And, and you knock on his door and said, I need three loaves of bread to feed him. But the neighbor's going, are you kidding me, dude? Now, also in this society, a lot of the homes only had one room. So that on the door at midnight, all the kids were probably sleeping not far from that door. Can you imagine being the upset parent answering the door? Jesus tells good stories. Suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me, the door's already locked, my children and I are in bed, I can't get up and give you anything. Maybe add a little sarcasm in there, why didn't you make enough bread for yourself? Which one of you, which one of us would have the nerve to wake up a friend in the middle of the night, his family as well? That's what Jesus is saying. Now here's, listen, I I use the NIV translation of the Bible and whatever translation you'll read, that's the right one for you. But I love the NIV and I love the way that this is phrased in that translation. Look at this in verse eight. Jesus getting his bigger point across. He says this, he says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, in other words, you knock on my door at midnight and wake me and my kids up, it ain't gonna be because we're friends. Yet because, and I love this wording, because of your shameless audacity. He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. In the original language, the wording is so hard, so it's put together so correctly because it has to do with being absolutely shameless. I need bread to help. I'm going to knock on your door and I will keep on knocking until you give me something. Now it gets to the biggest point of what Jesus is trying to say. Look at this. Jesus is trying to tell us to approach him that way. Verse 9. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks the door will be open. It's almost like Jesus is saying, I want you to be that persistent kid to his mom. Continuing to ask for all of you moms that are in the room. And you've ever had a toddler who can only say one word, mama, 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 mama. And whether you're wearing a dress or pants or sweatpants, you constantly have this tug going, mama, 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 mama. You know what I'm talking about, ladies? Y'all with me? All right? That's the way Jesus says, I want you to continually approach God. Continue to go to God and say, God, who can you put in my life today? God, I need to be able to share. I want to be a blessing to someone. I want to live a life that is sent. God, do this. Help me. Please, God. That's the way God wants us to approach him. Because it might just be out of the fact that we are so audacious as we come to God and we've removed every bit of shame from our lives and we just say, God, do this. See, here's the crazy thing. God wants us to do that. Those of you who are parents and you've had a kid constantly tugging on your leg, no, you don't want them to do that. But I can tell you when the day comes that it feels like they don't need you anymore, you yearn for the days that they needed you. And God says this, listen, if you come to me and you ask, I'll give. If you knock, I'll open. If you seek, you'll find. I'll be there for you. I will do, this is crazy. Here's a statement for you. It'll be on the screen for you. God will always answer the prayer that aligns with his will. God is saying to us, come and knock and ask and seek and find the way I'm asking you to with shameless audacity. Who do you think is going to reach those people in your life that God has placed in your life? You. 
You. God puts you in the exact work environment, in the exact family, with the exact neighbors, because God has you there to live a life that is simp. Will you be a blessing? Will you be a blessing? Verse 11, Jesus continues his story and he says, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, you'll give him a snake instead? What a great story. If he asks for an egg, you'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God says, I just want to answer for you. See, in prayer, and I'm going to give you a couple of statements, and if you're going to try to write these down, don't even try to write them down. Just go to the website, and you can get them that way, all right? In prayer, we open ourselves to God and the leading of his spirit. In prayer, we focus our minds to recognize his promptings. In prayer, we receive the direction we need to discover the people that God is calling us to bless. Every day, every day, we begin with prayer. Every day you should. You should say, God, who is it you want me to bless today? Who is it you want me to, to I don't know what it's going to look like. I, listen, I've been praying. I've been doing this prayer for quite a long time. Been saying, God, who is it? Th- this last week, I've got a neighbor that I've been neighbors for 16 years across from this guy. We, we've been friends. I've talked to him about Jesus. He, he lets me know he's a Christian and, and his family doesn't attend church, but he talks to me about it a lot. And uh, we kind of got this little niche with woodworking. We both like to, to, to make things with wood and, and we hang out and talk a little bit that way. Well, a couple of weeks ago, he told me that he had an aneurysm in his, in his abdomen and he was going to have to have surgery. He's pretty nervous about it. And I was like, man, I'll pray for you because that's what pastors do, right? We go, I will pray for you, my friend. That's because you always ask the pastor to pray. That's why we have an ordination certificate, only so that we can pray at the stuff. But anyway, um, I'm driving home. I think it was Tuesday, maybe Wednesday. Um, I'm driving home, and uh, as I pull down the road, my neighbor's sitting on his front porch, and he always throws his hand up, and we always wave at each other. And that morning, just like just about every morning, I said, God, who can I bless today? As I was driving home, I drove by, he threw his hand up, and it was like the Holy Spirit said, go pray with him. Pulled down the driveway, it's like it threw my stuff in the house. I went back across the road, and I walked up on his porch, and I said, man, how you feeling? He said, not good. I said, what's the most nerve-wracking thing about this procedure? And he said, I don't know if I'm going to wake up. Oof, there's a crisis moment. We talked for a few minutes. And I said, hey, I, I, I can't go with you Friday morning. He had to be there at five o'clock Friday morning. I said, man, I can't go with you. Um, can I pray for you right here? And he was a little bit uncomfortable and he was like, yeah, 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 go ahead. And, and I just said, God, let my buddy come through this. I, I prayed, this is my neighbor who's becoming my friend. Help him walk through this. Help him to be a testimony and to be able to share how your grace has, has brought him through. I got done praying, I looked up, and he was crying. Of course, nobody should cry alone, so he cried, and I started crying. And it was, we, we, like, we wanted to hug, but we're men, so we didn't. But, uh, but we, we felt like we both wanted to. But uh, I, I will tell you, you know, he had a surgery Friday. It's been successful. He's doing well. Hopefully, he'll be home in a few days. But it was just that moment where I went, okay, God, come on. What do I need? So let, let me give you something really quick, and then I'm going to bring a, a friend out here to kind of close out the message this morning that will share with you what it is to begin with prayer and what God can do. So let, let me give you something. It all starts with P's. This will be really simple to remember. Hopefully you don't have to go pee when I'm done with this, all right? So let me give you a really quick tool that, that, that I found in this. If you're going to begin every day with prayer, simple P's. You ready? Number one, plan. Everything that's important in our lives, we write down. We put on Google Calendar. We do something with it. We write it down. You need to plan. You need to have a time every single day. If that's first thing in the morning, that's great. Before your feet swing out of the bed, God, who can I bless today? I know I'm supposed to live a life that's sent. Who could it be? So that's plan. Number two, prepare. As you pray, ask God to prepare your own heart for the adventure. So you've got one of two things. You can either get mad at the person that does something in your life, or you can ask God to prepare your heart for the little hiccups that'll happen through the day and see what God's going to do. The third P is places. As you pray, make a mental map of the places you're going to visit during the day. Listen, we're all creatures of habit. If you have a job or even if you're a stay-at-home mom and you got certain days you go grocery shopping or whatever it may be, you pretty well know what you're going to do. Make a mental map of that day and say, God, who are you going to put in my way? Who are some people that I'm going to see? Who are the five people you put on my mind that I need to pray for? Make a map. Think about the places. And then the fourth one is the people. Ask God to show you how to be a blessing to your neighbors and the people around you that you encounter. Remember when you pray for people, 
you're already blessing them. Begin with prayer. I want to share something with you, and then a friend of mine is going to come out here and share a little bit more. Um, several years ago, um, when I became the pastor here, uh, 10, 11 years ago, I don't remember when it was. Hang on. Mm. Thank you, Jesus, for water. Um, when I became the pastor here, I, I inherited um, the debt of this building. Uh, we owe a lot on this building, over a million dollars. Um, anybody want to write a check? But anyway, um, we owe a lot. And I got to tell you, that it felt like a big burden. I remember early on in, in being the pastor here, I would often have these, <laughs> I would have these prayers where I was like, God, um, is there any chance that one of the terrorists can miss D.C. and drop a bomb on this building? It'll just be done. It'll be good. That's a horrible prayer, by the way. Um, but I was just like, man, it's all concrete. It'll have to be a really hot fire. Anyway, I, I was just kind of walking through it, going, I'm so tired of having this debt. And then I had, I had some great people in my life. One of them being Pastor Kyle was like, this is loving rebuke. Hey, stop it. Stop thinking of the building that way. Uh, meeting with our elders who are just godly guys in my life and our elders are encouraging me. Don't think of it as a negative. Don't think of it as a negative. How can we? And I begin to pray this. I begin to start every day by going, God, this building feels like such a burden. How can we use it? I don't want it to be a burden. I want it to be a blessing. Over the years, God has opened doors. We've partnered with our local homeschool uh, co-op and they use our building and there's a bunch of homeschool kids running around with teachers and getting opportunities and that's awesome. We've got ministries and, and all kinds of things. We partnered with a counselor uh, last year, year before last, uh, Restoration Counseling. You see the sign out on the road where we can offer professional counseling for people who need it and Joshua's here to help with that. And we just watch as God does crazy things. And I've been continuing to do this prayer. Just say, God, how can we bless people? How can I be a blessing? What can you put in my path? What can you put there? A few weeks ago, a young lady from our church, um, who's going to come out here in a second and join me and tell a better part of the story, um, she came by to see me. The reason she came to see me is a friend of hers told her to come see me. And she started sharing with me what was going on in her life. And I was just sitting there and she didn't know how big I was smiling inside because I just went, there you go, God, another opportunity. Um, so Kelly, Miss Kelly LaRoe, she's going to come out here. Please be behind the screen. There she is. Okay, cool. All right. Kelly's going to come out here. Kyle didn't open the screen for you, did he? All right. Come on out here. I want you to share your story. I love Miss Kelly, and y'all are going to be blessed by this. All right. You good? Yeah. You already did it once. This is a piece of cake. All right. Oh, you ate something. Please don't puke it. All right. Go, girl. Get it. Go. Hey, y'all. So I'm Kelly LaRoe, and I feel like everybody knows this, but people don't. So I'm a person in long-term recovery from substance use addiction. Um, and I had nine years in October. Um, so thanks. thank you. Um, so I have a history of homelessness, divorce, DSS, removing my children, me getting them back. Um, just, you know, ugly ugly stuff. Um, and so I eventually surrendered and went to rehab and I have a very clear memory of one moment in rehab, everyone praying and I was overcome and started to cry. And when I lifted my head back up, I, the only way to say it is I, I got it. Like it clicked and I got it. And I knew that I was going to be all right. Um, I walked out of rehab homeless and very quickly relapsed for about 10 days. I was in my car, living in my car, um, no gas, under E, um, and prayed to God, if you'll get me to the rescue mission, I'm done. Uh, and my car cranked, and it shouldn't have. So I went to the rescue mission, <laughs> um, and then um, I learned through my 12-step fellowship to pray only for knowledge of God's will in my life and the power to carry that out. So for years, that's what I would pray, just your will be done, your will not mine, your will in my life. Um, and so then eventually I was at Living Water, and I was sitting right over there, and Tony was doing a class on how to share your story more easily. I was working at GB Shoes, and God said to me very loudly, peer support. So I, and that's a certification you can only get if you're a person in recovery from substance use or mental health. Um, and so I left here. I told my husband. I told my boss. My boss uh, gave me a week off when it, that was impossible. You didn't get a week off at GB Shoes. Um, and she said, if, I, if you're being convicted by the Lord, who am I to stand in the way? So I went to peer support training. There's a lot more that unfolded there that was God. Um, but 
the next thing, big thing that happened was I was standing here for blessings in boxes and my phone rang and it was the executive director of the free clinics offering me um, post overdose response team. So I had walked to the back, took the call, should have walked straight back up here to my husband and instead I went that way. And during Blessings in Boxes, this room is full of toys and bikes and not chairs. It doesn't look like this. I got over here. I stopped with a friend, and I asked her to pray just that God's will be done with that job, not necessarily that I get it. I knew, immediately knew. The spirit fell, and I knew I was going to work there. Um, and then I realized in that moment I was standing where I had been sitting when God told me peer support. Um, so my continued prayer throughout my time as a peer support specialist and at um, the post overdose response, be- response team has been put it in front of me and I'll go. If you show me, I'll say yes. Um, c- consistently pray that every single day. If you put it in front of me, I'll go. And the way that it's worked for me is that someone will say something or God will show me something. And the first time I brush it off, like, well, that's just crazy. And then the second time I pay attention. Um, so, um, so someone said to me, my supervisor said to me, you should go into private practice. And I said, well, you're insane because that's not ever my plan of course. <laughs> so uh, then someone else, a, a co-worker, asked me to go out to dinner, and she said the same thing to me. And I was like, well, now I have to do it. So I <laughs> said it to my husband, and we started down that journey of going, going into private practice, homeless in my car, begging God to crank it to, I'm going to go into private practice as a certified alcohol drug counselor. Um, and so then a friend said to me, you need to tell Tony about Yana, that's my private practice. You are not alone, Yana. Um, And so I was like, yeah, yeah, I will. You know, whatever, I'll tell the church eventually. And so then she was pretty persistent the next time and said, you really need to go talk to Tony. And so I did, and I walked in and sat down and I said, I don't know what I'm supposed to say to you. I just know that I'm supposed to tell you. <laughs> um, and so I did. Do you want to take over Come at this on, let's spot? Do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and when I said, I don't know what I'm supposed to say, I just know I'm supposed to tell you, he said, well, start talking. So I did. So we let her talk, and she began to share with me about this new ministry called Yana. You are not alone. And telling me what God had done in her life. And like most mornings, I started off that morning going, all right, God, who am I supposed to bless today? How are we going to be a blessing? And she began to tell me about this ministry. And as she was telling me and about the friend who told you to come see me, and I'm sitting there listening, and I said, "Um, hey, Kelly, um, are you paying rent where you are? And she said, yeah, not much, but we're paying rent. And I said, why don't we just do this at the church and you don't be over there anymore? And she just kind of went, she started crying. And then, like I said, you shouldn't cry alone. So I cried and she cried. We were good. But anyway, um, so she, she tells me, well, okay, well, this was, what did we decide? Wednesday? It was a Wednesday. Wednesday. It was a Wednesday. Wednesday. And then Friday night, she's at a concert for King and Country concert that she's at with her family and some friends. And she sends me a text and she says, I need you to read this text I just got. And it was from her landlord. Her landlord said, I just want to let you know that we're going to be selling the building and you need to move out because we're not going to be renting the building anymore because we're selling it. I said, Tony, I just lost my office. And he said, no, you didn't. You're just relocating to live in water. That's right. So we're going to welcome Miss Kelly. Thank you, sweetie. You are good to go. I love you. You're awesome. So part of this message was me being able to announce this. Part of me is saying, you know what happens when you pray and you say, God, how can you use me? You might go from homeless coming out of rehab with a car that won't crank, empty with gas when God miraculously cranks your car to a place to where you sit in a pastor's office. My voice just came back. Y'all hang on. Uh, And and you sit in a pastor's office and go, I don't know what God's going to do, but I'm supposed to sit and talk to you. And the pastor looks at you and go, come on, girl. This is another way we get to be a blessing here at this church. So you're going to see in the weeks to come, right out of this door, right up here in one of the front classrooms, we're turning that into an office for Yana. You are not alone. And Kelly's practice will be here in our building, just another partnership that we're going to have. Y'all can applaud for that if you want to. Some people are going, let us clap, let us clap. You did. Thank you. 
You know where it starts? Begin with prayer. Begin with prayer. Every single day, God is putting people in your life with a divine appointment that you're supposed to be there. What would happen? What what, what would happen? I got to this very moment in the first service and just had the Holy Spirit go, say this. This very week, I was having a conversation with somebody and I asked them the question. I said, is everything in your life, is everything that you do in your life about honoring God? Really was a really good conversation I had with this guy. And then as we got to the end of the conversation, um, just told a story. It's a story about Jim Elliott. Um, don't know if you know who Jim Elliott is. Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, and I can't think of the other guys. In the 40s, 50s, somewhere along in there, um, they were missionaries. And they wanted to reach the Alka Indians in South America. They flew a, a small aircraft and landed on a beach uh, near where the Alka Indians lived. And ultimately, the Alka Indians came out and murdered these uh, four missionaries. Um, the, the, it's, if you've ever read the book Through Gates of Splendor or The Tip of the Spear, you saw the movie, whatever, it's about their lives. Um, uh, what's really cool about the story is, is that whole village has now come to Christ and the people who actually killed Jim Elliot, he's like helping raise one of the nephews and nieces of Jim Elliot now in that village because Jesus' work is just continuing there. But uh, great story. But um, after, after uh, uh, Jim Elliot's death, his wife, Elizabeth Elliot, she began to publish some of his writings that he had done when he was at Moody Bible Institute and different places of ministry that he served. And there's a statement that's, um, that Jim Elliot made. Remember, this is a guy who gave his life to Christ, literally gave his life to reach people. Um, Jim Elliott had made a statement somewhere along the way while he was at Moody Bible Institute, and he said this. He said, um, <clears throat> the world has yet to see a man or woman who is fully surrendered to God and what can come of a life fully surrendered to God. I, I thought of that in first service and remembered that and just said, that's how I'm ending. What would it look like? What would it look like in your life? Listen, I'm gonna give, give you practical things every single week. I don't wanna be a preacher that just stands up here and gives you the this, thous, and those, but I wanna give you something to walk out of here with every time we talk. I can give you that, but the thing I can't give you is the desire in your heart that says, I wanna be that person. I wanna be that person that is so sold out to God that the world changes because of my prayer and because of what I do. And then, could we dare to dream for just a few minutes? What would it look like if every person in our church had that type of prayer? Listen, I'd fill up every room in this building with ministries. We do, got so many thoughts going through my mind. I, I just don't, I think we're right at the tip of what God's doing. So I, I'm not gonna finish with some big statement, nothing that's gonna be Twitterable when I get done. But I do want to finish with this question, okay? They're going to put it up on the screen for me. This is what I want you to ask. Who are the people you can begin to pray for, asking God to give you the opportunities to bless them? Who are they? Remember those five people you thought of in 10 seconds? Right now, tomorrow morning, the next morning, God put them in my path. How about the unexpected? God, whatever you put in my path. By the way, you know how to define, you know how to find divine appointments? They happen, and you do them, and you step back and go, I see you, God. That was you. Just live your life in such a way that you're wanting to bless people. Maybe this morning you're not a Christian, or you're new to church, and you're going, man, listen, God wants to bless you. He already did. We prayed for you before you came in the building this morning. Every seat in this room gets prayed over. Every person in this room that steps in, even though we don't know who you are, we pray for you every single week. I do personally. I don't have any idea what God may be doing in your heart. If you're not somebody who's a follower of Jesus this morning, this is the day for you to give your life to Jesus. You came in here because you thought somebody was going to buy you chicken afterwards. Bad news, Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays. But God brought you here because you need Jesus. Don't leave today without knowing him. Come talk to me. Stop at our new here desk. Ask somebody, how do I get to know Jesus? And we'll walk with you. If you are a Christian this morning, who's the people that you need to bless? Who are they? Jesus, I love you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the opportunity to share your word. And God, I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray that we become a church that is so desirous to see people come to you. God, that we live it, we breathe it everywhere we go. We look for those divine appointments. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.